good evening am i audible yes okay 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 so okay 7 8 deadlines are on 30th okay so week 7 we went through it last time uh, decision trees and uh, linear classifiers a bit of linear classifiers and decision trees right so what we do today is we focus on naive days right that's uh, all of week 8 is about naive days right so we look at the theory to some extent but uh, We'll also look at one concrete example, and hopefully that will cover most of the things which are required. Uh, yes, Pawan. Uh, excuse me, sir. I have a doubt in week six. Uh, can I ask? Ah, uh, no, not right now because right now in my agenda is to uh, look at week eight, uh, and if we towards the end of the session, if you are still around. If it gets over early, we'll cover that part. Okay, sir. Okay. All right. So let's get started. So name base. Uh, it's the week starts with this distinction between what are called uh, generative versus discriminative models, right? So it starts off with this distinction. So uh, so far we have not introduced any probabilistic approach towards classification right so what we have done in knn and decision trees is for knn you just look at a data points neighbors and do a voting right so you just uh, vote among the neighbors of the data point and you say this belongs to the most uh, the majority class is the one which you will predict as the label of this this data point right so that is knn it's totally deterministic right once you fix k you know for every data point what the class is going to be in a deterministic fashion there is no probabilistic component or no probability that is entering the picture right same with decision trees if you if you tell me what is the stopping criterion so stopping criterion is like when the node and keep growing the tree until the nodes are pure right so once you give me a data set and a stopping criterion i know deterministically what's going to happen right you are going to search for the question which will have the maximum information gain and you do a split and then you keep splitting the other nodes in a recursive manner until you reach pure nodes, right? So both decision trees and k nearest neighbors are deterministic. Linear classifiers are also in a sense deterministic, right? So if you, uh, I mean, the linear regression classifier that we saw, right? The one which used the mean squared error. So we haven't seen all possible linear classifiers. We saw a very specific class of linear classifiers that also seems to be deterministic. Right, so now we are shifting the perspective and looking at the process of classifying data sets in a probabilistic sense. Right, so what do we mean by that? You have x your data point, and you have the label y. Right, so this together put together gives you a data set. Now you are looking at the joint probability distribution. Right, the joint distribution over the data. Okay, so by the rules of probability, you must know that you can either write write it like this or like this. Right, so you either condition on x or you condition on y. So both of these are equivalent ways of writing the join distribution. Okay, so once you have this in place, what I would like to do is, of course, I'm I'm hoping most of you have watched the lectures, so I'm not going to go into details. Uh, I just want to go give you a picture of what each of these probabilities looks like, right? So what? So let's start with p of x, right? So p of x will look something like this right so by by look something like this what i mean is let's say these are the data points right this is your data set so you want to learn or you want to model this data set using a probability distribution what do we mean by that it means that for every point in this region right for every point in this region you, you are going to assign a probability right or or in the case of since this region is continuous, you will assign a density value, right? Probability density function. Think about it as a Gaussian, right? So if it's a Gaussian, then you will say that say it has mean mu some somewhere over here. Then you will say that this has a higher probability of occurring. 
than a point that is say farther away from the mean okay so when you are modeling the features alone right the x values alone there is no label entering the picture right so this is in some sense you can keep this as a visual understanding of what p of x is right for each point in the space there is some probability associated with it. okay so this is p of x p of x given y will look something like this right so now you are given what the label is right so you are given that these are the red data points and these these are the green data points right so these belong to class 0 this is class 1 so now what you can ask is okay now that i know that this is red and this is green now i can you know ask a question a similar question that i asked here but then conditioned on the label right so i can ask okay what are the probability that this point is going to come up when i try to generate a data point right so i try to generate a data point what is the probability with which i will generate this green point right so here it was all blue right the label was missing here you are conditioning on the label right so you can so this is p of x given y okay but what we are finally interested in whether we look at generative or discriminative models is this quantity right so p of y given x finally that's what we want so how do you picture p of y given x you think about the space again and you take any point i have just chosen a particular black point here you are going to ask this question what is the probability that this is a green data point right what is the probability that i will color this point green okay that is p of y given x right so you are given the data point and now you have to find out what color you have to assign to it should it be green or red so if you keep doing this for every point in space you will end up with these decision regions and the the line or or the curve that separates these two decision regions is your decision bound right so in, in this this helps you discriminate between these two classes that's why if you are modeling p of y given x it's called discriminative whereas p of x given y what it helps you do is given the class it gives you a way to generate the data points right so given y i know how how to generate a particular sample okay on the other hand discriminative models what they'll do is they won't worry about how the data gets generated they just try to discriminate between the two classes right by say drawing a line or drawing a some more complex curve right so these are some images for you to keep in mind while trying to understand uh, the two classes of classification models okay, any questions at this stage not i'll move on okay, so that is the generative versus the discriminative part so now we'll go into one particular example this was also discussed in the lectures uh, but i want to take take this up in slightly more detail right so we look at the problem of classifying a piece of text here so the specific example that sir presented was spam classification right whether a given mail was spam or not spam so what we'll do is a slightly different problem so you have this data set given to you Okay, you have six data points. Each one is a piece of text. Okay, if you look closely, they are just numbers, but written in 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 the form of words. So your system, your classifier, what it has to do is it has to accept these words as input, and it should predict the label corresponding to it. All right. So this is the problem that this will be the running example throughout the session. So by just looking at these. words and their corresponding labels right can someone tell me what what this particular text is what could be the generative process behind this data is there any pattern that you are able to see or is it just random words and then and then assigning random labels to them any guesses anyone okay even and odd that's an interesting answer okay majority odd or even words right that's the exact answer okay that's correct so 
if you look at each so this is the process that i used to generate the words of course depend this this will not be clear to you this won't be evident to you in general right so when you're looking at some really complex data uh, say complex text, cla text classification problem you won't know exactly what the the un underlying process is but in this case i'll tell you what i did so in each sentence uh, if you can treat this as a sentence the number of even words are more than the number of odd words for label zero right so here two four eight six seven there's only one even sorry one odd but the rest three are even so if the number of even numbers is greater than number of odd numbers the label is zero if the number of odd numbers is more such as this example right one three five nine six then the label is one okay i hope this this process is clear to you so this is the process i used to generate the data but what we are interested in is given this data set how to learn a classifier okay that is our problem all right so i hope this is clear to you so now can someone tell me how you will how will you feed this into a computer right so these are all words label is a number but these are all words so how will you make a system understand that x is some feature vector so how do you go from the words to a feature vector Okay, you maintain a dictionary of one to ten words, right? That's correct. So, what we'll do is we we'll say that there are ten features. Okay, F one means one, F two is two, so on. F nine is going to be nine, and F ten in this case is zero, right? So, we'll we'll have these ten features. Now, if you take a particular example, let's say this is seven one three is one of the Uh, training example right this is one example now the feature vector corresponding to that will be the following right so wherever there is one so one will be one three will also be one seven the position corresponding to seven will be one everything else will be zero okay do you all get this uh, how we move from the sentence to the feature vector okay so that is the feature vector now what is the dimension rd if we call the data set as lying in some rd what is the value of d going to be 10 and right so it's going to be r10 so in general x is going to be f1 to f10 where if i is a binary value right it can only be 0 or 1 we are not so there are two things we are not doing okay first thing is we are not interested in the ordering of the words so Two four eight six seven is the same as seven six eight four two. Okay, so that is one assumption we are making. Order is not important. The second assumption we are making is that the frequency of words is not important. So if seven here repeats twice, okay, I will still count only one, right? I will still count it as one occurrence of seven. Okay, so these are two fundamental assumptions in our encoding scheme. So we are ignoring order. We are ignoring frequency. We are only counting. the presence or or rather we are only interested in the presence or absence of a word okay so yeah so x is now in r10 and y is in 0 comma 1 okay so now i just have one question if if i have a new sentence that i add to my data set that has 100 words in it will x be in r100 or will it be in r10 should be in r10 otherwise how you land okay right it should be in r10 so don't get confused by the length of the sentence the number of words in the sentence and the dimensionality of the feature space so these are two different things okay so your sentence could be however long it needs to be but finally it all is mapped to a 10 dimensional feature space okay so that is r10 Right, so this is the setting. Now, uh, so in, this is just a small visual picture of uh, what happens. So, what is the generative process? If you have seen the lectures, Sir talks about this uh, generative story, right? So, uh, the story for this will be: so you want to generate this data point one five eight, 
and you want to generate a point from the class one. Okay, so first thing that you'll do is for both these classes, you'll maintain 10 coins, right? So this is these are going to be 10 coins for each class. Okay. First thing you will do is you'll toss this coin corresponding to the label, right? So if you want to pick a label, in this case, there is a coin corresponding to that. So let's say it, it turns heads, right? Heads means uh, y equal to one, let's say, right? So that's the first step in the process. The second step in the process is what? You will you will toss each of these 10 coins. Okay, some of them will come up as heads, some of them will come up as tails. So whenever heads comes up, you include that word, right? So whenever it, it's green, you include it. Whenever it's red, you exclude it, right? So in, in that way, you get this particular training example, 158. Okay, so likewise, you have generated this entire data set of six data points. Okay, so that's what has happened. Okay, so once you have understood that, now let's go and look at this whole uh, picture of the uh, idea of class conditional independence, right? So now I'm just looking at one feature, right? Here, b equal to 10. So p of x1, p of x given y is p of x1, so on, so forth, comma xd given y, right? So there is no specific rule of probability here, right? So it's just, I've just rewritten this in terms of the features. Now, if the features are independent given the class, what is this going to be equal to? If you assume that this class conditional independence assumption holds good, how can I rewrite this? As a product of probabilities. Okay, as a product of probabilities, right? So I can write this down as P of X1 given Y, P of X2 given Y, so on, till P of XD given Y, right? So this is what is called the class conditional independence, meaning the features are independent given the class, okay? So conditionally, they are independent. They don't need to be independent of themselves, but they're only independent if you are given the information about the class, okay? So for example, if you have 7, 1, 3, given 1, okay? You can break it down into P of 7, given 1, 1, given 1, 3, given 1. Okay, so that's all uh, we are talking about. In fact, there is a slight mistake here, but I'll come back to this. Anyway, so assume that you don't know, you would also looked at a model, a generative story where this assumption doesn't hold good, okay? So now let's briefly discuss that model also. Now assume that that class conditional independence assumption is not true, then how many parameters do you need to model this generative process? P of x comma y, if I want to represent P of x comma y as P of y into P of x given y, how many parameters do I need? But for this problem, right? So there are 10, d equal to 10, and uh, features are binary, and you have two classes. So how many will you need? Um, we'll need, first we'll need the probability of y equal to one. So that one parameter. Okay. And then we have 10 features. So, and each feature can take two values. So two power 10. All right, so that's two power 10 and one, is it? So is it the sum of these two? Uh, yes. Okay. Okay, I got the same answer. So I got 2 power 10 plus 1 as one answer. 2 power 10 as another answer. Now, anyone else wants to try? If you can give me the final number, that's also okay. What, what will be the final numerical value? Uh, 
two two d plus one is it? That will come a bit later. Two d plus one, but even before that. So two into two power ten. Okay. Well, you are missing us something else, right? Okay. Not two two power d plus one minus one. Okay. What will that turn out to be here? Um, two power eleven minus one. Okay. Is it correct? Yeah. So two into two power ten. So that's two power eleven. And uh, so two to two power ten minus one plus one. Right. So I'll just spend a minute and uh, go through this. So. Is there any anyone who? No, I just can't follow it. Uh, how how you derive this relation? Okay. Uh, did you watch the lectures? No, I, I I couldn't watch. Okay. So are there others who have not watched the lectures, or have you all watched the lectures? I'm like going under the assumption that you have all watched it. No, sir. Me too. I didn't watch. Okay. We can't even watch. No. No, 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 sir. No. Okay. All right. Then. Okay. I'll maybe take that into account and proceed a bit slowly. Then. So, see what's happening is you have two part d minus one parameters, right, to represent one class. So, if you have ten words, right, let's take this case of ten, ten. Uh, Possible words, right? So one, two, three, four, till nine, and then zero. So how many words or how many sentences can you come up with? How many sentences can you come up with in this configuration? So you have thing, right? So I just gave you one possible sentence. So this is one sentence now. Like this, how many sentences can you write down? Ten factors. Mm, not factorial, right? So you are ten, I think. Two to the power ten. Yeah. So included, it may not be included, or likewise, two may be included, may not be included, three may be included, may not be included. So this yeah. is two, 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 and up to ten. Yeah. So this is two part ten potential sentences, right? So you can come up with two part ten sentences, and then now, if you were to represent, if you were to model uh, each of them, uh, you have to give it a probability value, right? So p of x given y, right? So if, if there is no independent assumption that you are assuming, where And you're saying that the features are not independent given the label. Then what what you have to settle for is that you have to give a probability value, separate value for each possible sentence in your data set. Okay, in your exhaustive data set that you have, you have to give a probability value for every one of these two part ten sentences. So since there are two part ten possible sentences, you'll have one less. Okay, the number of parameters you need is one less because probability is up to sum to one, right? So that's how you get this uh, two power d minus one. So you have d as your vocabulary size, two power d minus one parameters, and that is just for one class, right? Now we have two classes. You have class one, class zero. So you have to represent the parameters for both, right? So you multiply that by two, and then you have one parameter for prior, right? So the prior probability of Uh, determining which class you are going to pick an example from. Okay, so you need a parameter for that. So that's two part d minus one into two plus one. Then you'll you'll end up with two part d plus one uh, minus one. Is that clear? Yeah. Yes. So see what I suggest is uh, I I thought you would have seen the lectures because it's like Friday right so Friday two days from now is the the due date for the assignment so 
uh, I was going under that assumption, right? Had the session been like, say, two days back, I wouldn't have even assumed that. But since it's like so close to the deadline, I thought you would have all seen it. Uh, anyway, so in that case, the session might be a bit, uh, it may, things may go over your head because there are certain things I'm going to assume that you know. Okay. Anyway, so uh, what happens if we assume that the features are independent given the class level? How many parameters do we need then? Two D so plus one. Two D plus one, right? So you need. This is the case of considering each of these as a separate coin, right? So you are you're, we are going to toss a coin, and uh, there is a parameter corresponding to the coin, this particular coin, right? So there are ten coins here. So for each of these coins, a probability associated with that is there. So there are like two into ten. So ten here, ten here, right? So two into ten, twenty. And then one parameter for knowing which class you have to sample the data of uh, the training example. For. Right, so that's how you get two D plus one, right? Two into ten plus one. The number of parameters for a class into the number of classes plus uh, one parameter for the prior. Sir, I have a doubt here. Yeah. Um, in this case, if the label is suppose zero. Okay. Okay. And uh, since we have 10 features over here, so given the label zero, it can either take like one of the 10, right? Label is zero. Okay. I get that part till that I have got. But then after that? Then, then we have 10 values, like the 10 words from. Correct. One, two, three, four. Okay. So. Uh, given label one, it can take either of these 10 values. Then why we are not like taking that minus one parameter over here, like D minus one. Ah, okay. You're saying, so you're asking that it was two for D minus one. Uh, why mm -hmm. not here two into D minus one? Mm -hmm. Okay. So see that, what were we doing there? So two for D is the total number of it's your sample space, right? Size of your sample space. So total number of training examples are 2 power d, correct? And uh, the, you are assigning a probability to each one of them. And all these probabilities should sum to 1, therefore 2 power d minus 1. Now, here what is happening is the generative process itself is different, right? So you're saying there are d coins, OK? And each of these d coins themselves are independent of each other. So whether I toss this coin or not, I'm I'll I'll still have to toss this coin. Whether I toss the second coin or not, I have to toss each of the remaining nine, whatever number of coins, right? So I need d separate coins. That's the basic idea. I need d coin. I can't do with just d minus one coins, right? If I stop with nine, there will be no way to generate a zero. So I need d parameters. OK, got it. OK, so uh, there you're looking at the actual example. And for each example, you're assigning a probability. Here, what you're doing is you're only assigning the probabilities to the coins themselves. And tossing them or not tossing them, sorry, uh, tossing them and getting heads or not heads, that will give you each word in your uh, sentence. OK, so that's what uh, happens. Uh, now, yeah, there's one more question. If the words are repeating. So that's what I said, right? The the model, the assumption is that if the words repeat, okay, we are going to ignore sequencing, right? So uh, let me just go to this, right? So assume that you have these two data points, right? So there's one data point that is say one two three. There is one more data point that is one two three three 
one. Okay, what I'm saying is both of them are the same data points according to me. I am not considering frequency. I'm only I'm only interested in occurrence. Right? So one, two, three, three, one is the same as one, two, three. Okay, this is this is an assumption, right? You could if you assume differently, then you'll have to account for it differently. Right? So that is one thing. Second thing is this is this data point is the same as 312 or any permutation of this, right? Or 321. Order is also not a problem. Okay, this is this is of course uh these are not very powerful assumptions, but if you notice there is an assumption called there is this way of modeling called bag of words model, right? So it's in in what we call natural language processing or crudely speaking text text processing, you have you treat sentences as a bag of words, right? So it's a bag, and in that bag you throw in these words. Okay, so you just totally ignore ignore the order. Okay, you in this case they they also treat the frequency information, right? So they represent it as a Python dictionary. So for example, this particular sentence, right? John likes to watch movies, Mary likes to likes movies too. Movies occurs twice. Okay, they have taken that into account. Okay, so that is an assumption which we are additionally imposing that not just order, okay, but also frequency is not important for us, right? So in the, in the bag of word models, what they assume is the order of elements is free, right? So order is not important, but frequency is important. So this is something like a bag of words model, but with extra assumptions. Okay, so that is what we are doing. So how many of you are still there and have not lost what we have done so far? So is there anyone who is finding it very hard? Then I what I request you is uh, please watch the recording after you go through SARS lectures because the lectures are outstanding. So uh, you if you watch the lectures, you don't even need the session in some sense. So uh, this is only if you have you know watched the lectures and for whatever reason or not able to grasp few points here and there. Okay, so this is, we are in text classification, right? So this class conditional independence, we have looked at what, what it means, and we have looked at how many parameters you need if the assumption of independence is taken and not taken, okay? So this is where we, we are, right? Okay, before we go to MLE, in, I just want to make sure that you have understood this. So let me ask this particular question. This is there in the practice assignment also? So this may be useful practice. So assume that you have a vocabulary of size four. Okay, so there are four. Okay, let me make it slightly more generic. Okay, let me put keep this as binary only. No, let me keep this as zero, one, two, three, four. Okay, right. So you have now features F F I E, right? A feature F I. F I can take any one of these four values earlier it was binary right now i'm saying no no uh, feature can take four four values any one of these four values and you are there are like uh let's say 10 features okay, let's keep the features same like what we had there are 10 features but instead of features being binary they now can take four values okay so if you have to Use the first generative story. So this is generative story one, according to the lectures, where we are ignoring as conditional independence, right? So we are ignoring the assumption, which means the features are not independent given the class. Okay, features are not independent given the class. So with this assumption in place, can someone tell me how many parameters you would need? Binary classification, right? So two classes. So I'll just give you this one parameter, which is going to be 
are representing the prior probability, right? Whether it is class one or class zero, you need one parameter. So I'm giving you that. So, sir, there are only two labels. There are only two labels. Yeah, it's a binary classification problem, zero or one. Okay. So prior is taken care of. Now, what about the others? Um. Uh, then we will need like for each class we'll need a uh, four power ten minus one feature, and like that we have two classes. Okay. That is two into four to the power ten minus one. Ah uh, yes. Sir. Okay, that's correct. Right. So uh, for those who are not getting this, let's uh, just visualize these boxes. Right. So we have. Mm. So this is what this is a box. Okay, there are ten boxes like this. Okay, and if you want to generate a data set, I'm I'm just giving you three boxes here, right? If you want to generate a data point, this can take one of the four values, right? This could be zero, this could be three, okay, this could be four. Wait, okay, this is not zero, one, two, four, zero, one, two, three. Okay, so. Now, like this, I need to generate seven more numbers, right? Now, each box can take one of the four values. There are ten boxes, so you can take four power ten values in total, right? Now, four power ten parameters are needed, but since they all should sum to one, we need one less than four power ten, right? So, four power ten minus one. Now, there are two classes, right? So, you multiply that by two. So, you need these many parameters for p of x given y, and then one parameter for p of y. So this is. I hope you all got because you were assigning a probability value to each training data point, right? So, or rather, each possibility you are assigning a value, and they all should sum to one. So it's like, what are these parameters actually? The parameters are representing p of x i given y equal to one or zero, right? So If you sum this across y equal to one to four power ten minus one actually, so or rather four power ten. Sum this whole thing; it, it has to be equal to one, right? Because one of these xi is only going to come, right? Four power ten is the full sample set size. So, no matter how you try to generate, the xi has to be one among these four power ten. So. You need one less than four power ten parameters. So each of these is a parameter, by the way. Okay, so this is generative story one. Okay, that is now if I use generative story two, where I use the assumption, right? I'm not ignoring, but I'm assuming class conditional independence. How many parameters will you have then? So, how many coins do you need for? I mean, it's not a coin in this case; it's a dice, more of a dice, less of a coin. Oh, two D, two D plus one. Okay, think about how two D plus one came. Why did we say D? Mm -hmm. Four, four D plus one. Is it because there are like four values that a feature can take, and there are ten features, so four into ten plus one of the prior. It should be two into ten. Two into ten. Am I right? Yeah, yeah. So there is two D plus one. There is four D plus one. Hmm. I kind of feel there is something else. That the answer is something else. Can you think more on these lines? Think about a dice. So each one is now going to be represented by one dice of um, having how many sides? Four sides, right? So how many parameters do you need to? Uh, it is four. Is uh, mm. So for a coin, which two-sided coin, you needed one parameter. For a four-sided dice, how many parameters do you need? Four. 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 Four.
So can we think like a base n number system or something so that it's easier for us to comprehend? Uh, well, it's a dice is not too hard, right? So assume that you have a dice which has four sides, right? You you roll this dice. Okay. Now, one of these four sides is going to come up, right? And what is the probability associated with zero coming up in the first dice? That's what this means, right? Now, how many parameters do you need to model that dice? See, the coin has two faces. You needed one parameter, right? Now, dice has four faces. So extending this logic, how many parameters would you need? Um, Do you need four parameters? Two, two or three is enough, like zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. So all the four combinations can be captured in two. Okay. Uh, we are only talking about one dice, right? So it's either zero, one, two, or three, right? You only need Correct. three parameters. Right? So for each dice, you need mm. three parameters. So now right. should we do three, three power should we do three power B or something else? Is it three power? Okay, I'll give you two options. Should we do three power ten or should we do three yeah. into ten? Three into ten, I think. Three into 10. We should do 3 into 10, right? Because they are anyway independent. You have 10 dice. You have to roll each one. Of, you have to treat each of them as independent of each other. That's the whole idea of class conditional independence, right? So you have three parameters for the first die, first dice. And then likewise, for all the 10 dice, you have these many parameters. So 3 into 10. OK. Now, this is for one class, correct? So for yes. One class. So there are. Two, two classes. So it's 2 into 3 into 10. And then the plus 1 anyway tax along because of the prior. Okay, so there was uh, one, one discourse answer, I think, where we have ML, there is a ML thing here. I don't know where it is, but uh, someone had asked. E8. So this one, not this one. Yeah, this one, right? So, can you all see this uh, solution? See, if you have this is the this is the formula that finally you can boil things down to, right? So here n is four, right? In our case, n is four, right? So it's n minus one, n minus one because if you have n values, you need one less for modeling the dice. So n minus one into there are d separate dices, right? So, oh, sorry, it's d separate dice. So, n minus 1 into d, and then there are k classes. Okay. So, it's n minus 1 into d into k plus k minus 1. k minus 1 is for the prior. Okay. So, this is the general formula if you are given n different values. Right? Did you all get that? How we arrived at that generic formula? Um, so this is where I'm getting confused. Like uh, during class condition, you said that we'll not assume it as a dice. We'll assume it as a coin and it has to be flipped. Uh, OK, OK. Yeah. So see, the dice, you have to understand that here. He, so in generative story one, you are considering a dice, right? You are correct. But each face of the dice, what is, what is there on each face of the dice? one training example right so you get it so there are 10 features right so each face of the dice will be of the form uh zero one two three right so let's let me just randomly generate some sequence so this is zero how many features are that here one two three four five six seven eight nine and okay so Assume that these are all comma separated, right? I am, we take time, but anyway, let me do it. 
So do you agree that this is one data point? I mean, one one possible feature vector. So this yes. feature vector will be written on one face of the dice in the generative in the first generative story, and likewise, you will have four power ten faces for that particular dice. So you will have all possible feature values written on four power ten faces. Okay, and now if you throw this dice with four power ten faces. One of these faces is going to come up, okay. So you need four power ten minus one parameters, okay. That is what that dice is in generative story one. Got okay, it. in generative story two, what is the dice doing? It's it's just it just has it is representing one feature, right? In in generative story one, the dice represented a training example, a complete feature vector. Here, it's only going to represent. This, right so this could be a coin if it if, if the features are just binary if it's not it's a it's it, it's itself a dice okay and there are 10 such dice and then you keep throwing them and that is the story there so if you have to you just have 30 parameters there uh yeah yes i got it i'm sorry i missed it yeah because it there were only uh like two classes or like two values that a feature can take we were assuming it as a coin, coin but now exactly. things, yeah got yeah. it sir sorry yeah. okay so i am assuming that it's clear now so we can now move on and from now on what we we'll assume is that this class conditional independence holds right so features are independent given the class so we'll come back to the coin case right so now the features are binary we have binary features and uh, we are going to keep tossing coins. Okay, so week eight is a bit heavy on the notations. Okay, so that's the only thing that's probably confusing in week eight. So there are, as far as possible, I've tried to stick to the notations are as used. So P is the probability of picking class one. Okay, so what will be the probability of picking class zero? One minus P, right? So that's P. Now, x i so if i just say x i then it is a feature vector right so if i just say x i and make it bold right what i mean is a feature vector so in in our case this is a 10 dimensional vector right so it could be something like 1 0 1 so on okay transpose so this is x i now when i say x i j what I mean is a particular value in this feature vector. Okay, so it could be zero or it could be one. Okay, so do you all get the distinction between xi and xij? Xij is one particular element in this vector. So when I say xij equal to one, it means that the jth word is present in the ith sentence. Okay, so did you all get this part? Uh, okay. Uh, okay, right. So this is xij means j word is present in the ith sentence. Okay. Now pjy, that's the tricky part. Pjy is what? It's the probability of the coin associated with the j word in class y. So let me go back to this particular image that you're seeing. So these are 20 coins, right? So p11. Okay is going to be this coin's probability okay p subscript phi superscript one is going to be this coin's probability p subscript phi the subscript is always going to be for the coin number coin index the superscript is going to be for the label okay so p subscript eight superscript zero will mean the probability of the coin associated with class zero that's what we mean by p j y i'll always say p j y Subscript and then superscript. Okay, so this is very important because this notation is kind of uh, mouthful and you'll, you'll have to keep getting used to this. Okay, so what we have studied so far uh, when it comes to probabilistic way of uh, defining things is one way of estimating the parameters of a distribution given the data is maximum like you would estimate, right? So that's what we'll do. The maximum likelihood estimate of this data set 
so the data set is what six examples that i showed you okay using this particular process of generating the data so i'll go slowly here now i have just taken one example so can you tell me can someone tell me what this expression stands for whatever is there in solid lines right so not the one which has been shaded out uh p of y i that means probability of picking a class that's correct right so this is the probability of picking a class okay in fact to be more precise is probability of picking class yi okay so if yi is equal to 1 what will this probability become p p right what if yi is 0 it will be 1 minus p, right so this is what i have written down is for the i training example what is the probability that this comes from class y right so that's just probability of the class okay p of y now the rest of it is p of x q and y now let's stick to the same i example what is this quantity now just this quantity uh probability of seeing j th word in uh, y th class for a feature x i j or for the presence of word j th word in i th sentence that's correct <laughs> yes. no 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 that that's correct yeah so you're correct so the what is the probability of seeing the j th word in the i th sentence from class y okay so i i just uh, go here and uh, rewrite this, this particular expression so i make it larger so that okay so p j y i said this probability that when you probability associated with the j th coin in class y right so concretely if y equal to 1 then and say j equal to 3 this is telling you the probability that you will find the word 3 coming in your example right so this is this is what it means now now i'll just go back to the variables so when i do something like this p j y a it means y a is could be 1 or 0 right so if y a is 1 it means what is the probability that the class 1 in class 1 i see the jth word occurring right so that is p j y y i what do we have here p j y a power x i j okay, you raise this power x i j now i'll also complete the the other thing right so this is times okay, so this is the expression Okay, it seems like a very complicated expression at the face of it. But tell me what this expression will boil down to if x i j is equal to one. X i j is equal to one. What will happen to this? This is zero, right? One minus x i j is zero. So I'll end up with this is just one. So this will go away. It will just be p j y a. Okay, so if x i j is one, what is x i j being equal to one? the jth word is present in the ith training example okay the word is present so if the word is present what is the probability of this word coming up this is the probability right this is what we have assumed to toss this jth coin with this much probability it will come up as heads right and coming up as heads is nothing but x i j equal to 1 so if x i j is, is 0 okay i will again use this if x i j is 0 let's see what happens this is something raised to the power 0 so this will become 1 okay so this will vanish x i j being 0 means power is 1 here so if the word does not occur this is the probability with which it does not occur okay this is the coin falling tails okay so and can you tell me if you have all understood uh, what this expression now means whatever i have shown here 
I am assuming that you have understood this, right? So what we have done so far is picking a class OA, that's the probability here, and then seeing the jth word or not in the i training example. So this is just for one word. What you have to now do is you have to do this for all d words, right? There are d words. You have d coins. So you have to toss all coins, right? So you do that d times. OK, now this expression that you have here is for just one example, right? One training example. Now we have to do this for all n training examples. And that is what is called the likelihood. We all understand the formula for the log, sorry, the likelihood given the data set. Is there anyone who is not getting this? So the formula is the format of picking the class and then checking whether the eighth word is present in the class. Ah, uh, yeah. So the formula is what it's telling you is if you are given a word, a sentence like this. Okay, let's take seven one three. Okay, if you are given a sentence like seven one three, what this will do is this particular without this i equal to one to n, just look at seven one three coming from class one. It will tell you what is the probability of 713 coming from class one. OK, this yeah. is the probability of that. This is P of x given y, right? That's what this is. P of x given y, I have written it down as. So this is P of x1 given y, P of x2 given y. P. This, is, this, this product is where the class conditional independence is used, right? Features are independent given the label that I have used to express it like this. So can someone tell me how, what gives me the you know, right to make this a product here? There is one other assumption that we are using here. What is that assumption? Likelihood. Likelihood, that is correct. Uh, the whole thing is the likelihood, but something lets me do this Product, sorry, product over all the training examples. What is that assumption that allows me to do this as a product? Independence. Class condition. Independence or IID to be more uh, specific. So the data points are independent and identically distributed, right? So because they are independent, we can write this down as a product over all in training examples. Okay, otherwise we can't. Right, so let me just quickly, I'll just, I'll just close this step. Summarize what we have done. What I've written down there is the following actually. So likelihood is what? The probability of seeing this data set. Okay, the probability of seeing this data set. That's basically it. Now, since the data set has n points, what are we doing? We are writing this down as a product, right? Over all the n points of seeing the feature vector and the label, right? This is what we have written down. So the first, the leftmost product stands for overall training examples, right? This is the likelihood. So let me call this L of, instead of calling it capital X, I'll call the data set, okay? L likelihood of this data set. So the inner summation is what? This is what the inner summation is, right? So for the inner product rather, I have expanded this p of xi give xi comma y as p of yi. Okay, so this should be yi. P of yi into p of xi given y. Okay, but xi is not a scalar. Remember, it's a vector of size 10. Okay, this is what we have. Now p of xi given yi, I have, un I have here. This is where I have used the class conditional independence. So instead of writing p of xi comma, so I'll just expand this. Maybe one more step is due. So this is x i one comma dot 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 x i ten, right? So there are ten features, right? So or x i d. If we are using d for features, this is what. So far, class conditional assumption has not been used. How I'm going to use it? Uh, how am I going to use it? I'll break down this p of xi comma xi 
one xi two so on given d as p of xi one given b uh, given y. Sorry, I'm like making mistakes. Too many of them, but I hope you won't. So this will be all all the other products still. Okay, so that this is where the class conditional independence is actually operating. Now I can of using this, I'll just treat this as p of x i j given y. Okay, and then I turn this into a product. Okay, where j goes from one to d. D. Okay, so this is the expression. So p of y a, if you notice, p of y a is nothing but this. Instead of writing it as p or one minus p, I have written it like this. And this p of x i j given y. We have written it in this slightly complicated form. Okay, is this clear? What what we have done so far? This is the likelihood for uh, the data. Now we can do one of two things. This is the derivation. Okay, so the derivation is not needed per se. If, uh, what I'll do is I'll leave it for now. I'll leave it in the slides anyway. I'll share the slides with you all. If you're interested in going over the derivation, you can go over it. If not, you can leave it. So very roughly, what, what I've done is I've taken the log, okay, and then differentiated it with respect to each of these parameters, right? There are 2D plus one parameters, right? So, so I have differentiated this, and you will end up getting some expression. So I, what we're interested now is in the final expression. Okay. So let's first look at the prior probability, right? So one where you toss the coin for the label. So what is this expression? Can someone uh, ex use English, simple English words to explain what this is? So which one? Uh, the P one, right? Uh, fraction of ones in the data set. Correct, right? So this is the fraction of examples that belong to class one, right? So fraction of ones in the data set. So whenever y is equal to y, that will be, uh, in fact, I should have made this one, okay? So make this, I'll make this correction before uploading. This should be y a equal to one, okay, and not y. So that is one correction. So that is the fraction of ones. How many of them are one? How many of them are zero will be one minus p. So what is this PJY? Um, it, it will be the in all the labels where the value is Y, uh, what is the sum of the features X, Y, Z? Okay. Uh, in all the examples that belong to class Y, what proportion of them contain the word J or contain the J word? Correct. So X I J is what it could be one or zero. When it is zero, this numerator that that contribution to the numerator is anyway zero, right? So we are only interested in when X I J is one. So when is X I J one? When the jth word occurs in that particular example. So your numerator is what? Find the number of data points or training examples where the jth word occurs in that example. Okay. For class Y, okay, we are only interested in those examples that belong to class Y. Among those which belong to class Y, look at the number of times the word J, the jth word appears divided by the total number of examples that belong to class Y. Okay, this is P, J, Y. All right, so if it's not clear, it will become clear when we look at the example. Okay, so that is all you need to remember from parameter estimation point of view. Okay, so let's come back. What is the value of P in this case? This problem, what do you think, P is? Uh, 
half, right? There are two six examples. Three of them belong to zero. Three belong to one. Okay, p is half, so that is simple enough. Oh, let's let's come to these twenty parameters. Okay, two d plus one, right? One that plus one term we have found out. Two into d, we need to estimate these twenty. So let's take the first five. Can someone tell me what? Pj zero is going to be for j ranging from one to five. Let's first look at the first five values. I start with one. Right? What is Pj one? Sorry, uh, P one zero. One, one, two, two times two by three. Okay, uh, you're saying that this is two by three. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, one by two. When the label is zero, uh, okay. one has come twice. Okay, so that is two by three. That's correct, right? So can someone note down this five values? So this is two by three. Let's now look at p two zero. What is p two zero going to be? One by three. Okay, one by three, right? So this two in the among the males, sorry, among the examples that belong to class zero, two has occurred in exactly one of those three examples, right? So it's one by three. So this is one by three. Is that fine? So it's a two. Oh, right, right. Sorry, two, two by three. Sorry, sorry. Two two. Two. Yeah, yeah. Stuck us twice. Right? So this is also two by three. So this is also mm. two by three. Okay. What about the word three? One by three. Okay. So there is only one three. Okay. In those zero mains. Okay. Likewise, I I hope you get the idea. So four. What about four? Four is again two by three. No, no. Four is not two. What is four actually? Uh, three, four. Okay. Right? Two, two by three. No, it's a one, one. One, one. Right. Yeah. So P four zero is one. Right. So you can keep doing this. So you'll see that it's two by three, two by three, one by three, one. P five zero happens to be zero because you see that five has not occurred even a single time in the text, uh, the examples from class zero. Okay. So P five zero is zero. Likewise, you can do this. Right. You can see that these are the values similar. So. Maybe let's just do P J one, P one one, and then I'll reveal the answers here also. One, what? Two by three, two by three. Sorry, it's a one, one. One, right? Because one has appeared in all training examples from class one. So the fre the frequency, uh, the the proportion is one. Okay, so that is one. Likewise, you can do for the rest. So maybe we'll take eight, right? So eight, you see, has not occurred in even a single training example from Class one training examples, right? So, so this is parameter estimation in the case of uh, naive base, right? With the class conditional assumption in place. Okay, so that is. I hope all of you got this. Okay, now we we'll come to the. So once you estimated the parameters, you are you are basically trained the model, right? That's what training is in naive base. Training the model on the data is all about estimating these two d plus one parameters. Once you have done that, you have trained the model. So what you need to do now is test the model. So you are given some data point eight two six eight two one six. Okay, you have to you have to now find out what the predicted label is. You have to find out the model's prediction for this example. So what do you think will be p of y equal to one given this data point? First of all, how do you calculate it? What formula will you use? Uh, base. Okay, base. right. You use the base rule. So that is where the base comes, right? So you use the base rule. So p equal to p of y equal to one into p of example given y divided by p of example on the data. Okay, data point. 
all right so i hope this is clear to all of you now most of the heavy duty lifting will happen in computing p of x given y so this is what we need we need to do so p of y equal to 1 remember is 0.5 so simple right so this part is the tough part p of 8216 given y equal to 1 okay now how do i do this so can someone compute this and tell me what the answer is going to be So which of these columns should I look at? So which of these two tables? First one or second one? Right, right second one. one. Second 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 one. one right? Okay, I'll use the second one. Okay. <coughs> okay, so I have just expressed it in the form of a feature vector, right? So one and two are one, six and eight are one, the rest are zeros. Okay, given I just numerically encoded this, right? because you know finally you have to process a computer has to process this, right so this is how the system will take this okay now what do you do now what do you know about naive base what is naive about it so we have to cut um... Calculate the inverse probability. That is, p y is equal to one and given a eight two one six. Ah, uh, that is what we started off with, right? That's what we need to find, but that's not so easy to find. So, what we can find, however, is the inverse, right? P of x given y we know because that is the generative model. So, that is where we are. So, we need to find this. There's no escaping this now. We have to somehow compute p of x given y. So, go back to our generative story. You know how will how would this how would this example have been generated? Okay. It's not still not clear. I'll show you one answer. You tell me if it is right or not. These are what these are four coins, right? So if I toss the eight coin, and if it comes up as sets, only then can I include that, right? So I just need to find out what p the, the coin probability is for these words one, two, six, and eight. If I multiply them, I'll get my probability. Is that correct? How many of you think this is correct? Actually, I'm not. Uh... I think if it is independent, then okay. Does anyone think that this is incorrect for whatever reasons? But do you have any, you know, slight doubt regarding this particular? No one? All your... uh, but we, we should take the joint probability to this is conditional probability and then uh, actually I have not gone through the lectures and that's why okay uh, but this is this is actually a basic probability question right if you think about it what I'm asking is how are we generating the data? We are generating the data by tossing coins. Whichever comes up as green or heads, I'm going to include that word, right? So what the, the sentence that has come up is, what is the sentence that has come up? Uh, P of, sorry, uh, the 8216, okay? 8216 from class one. So do I need to multiply these four probabilities and am I done? probability of seeing an 8 this is the probability of seeing 6 2 1 right since the features are independent given the label i can multiply right so that part is correct so that all or um, are we missing something okay i'll tell you that we are missing something can you tell me what we are missing 
you have to take one minus p for for the numbers which is not coming. Exactly right. That's what we are missing. Right. So please remember this is a very subtle point. Okay. Eight two one six have come because those four coins landed hits. Okay. Therefore, you are able to note that down. But you are, you should also remember that according to the generative story that we have, there are four. How many six other coins which we have tossed? Okay, we have we have still tossed those six coins, but then they didn't come up as heads; they landed as tails. So this is the probability that the third coin had tails in it, right? Or or, or the, that particular throw of that coin resulted in a tails. Is everyone convinced about this? Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, convinced. Okay, so this is the probability of. Observing this particular training example given class one. Okay, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you view it, this probability is zero. Okay, so why is this zero? You can just look at these values, right? So P three. Let's look look at P three one, right? So P three one is what? That is one. So one minus one is zero. That's enough to cancel every other positive value that you have. Okay. What do you think this is going to be? Since this has more even than odd, we expect this to belong to class zero. So, what do you think will be the probability here? One. Will it be a value very close to one or? P four zero. P four zero, P three zero, P five. What I think? This is this is also one minus P four zero and P four zero is one. So two like. Yeah, this is also zero. Hmm. Okay, so that seems very unfortunate because we have x given y equal to one is also zero. This is also zero, right? Now if you if you think about p of y given x, we are in trouble because. Both these. So what we are essentially saying is, this this particular sentence could not have come from either class zero or class one. That's what we are saying. Okay, so the sentence could not have come from any class. So if that is the reason. That's the case. We can't make a decision at all. So we are stuck. Okay. So this is one very common problem that's observed when you start implementing name base. So one way to get around this problem is what is called Laplace smoothing. Okay, so so notice why this problem occurs. This problem occurs because you have certain words, such as say phi. In the case of class zero, you have the word phi, which never occurs anywhere. Okay, so if the word phi does not occur anywhere, then the probability for that will be zero. While estimating the probability, you will estimate it as zero. Okay, and if you Have a new test example that contains the word five, then you are in trouble because your entire probability will turn into zero. Okay, so one way to fix this zero probability is to add a training example that contains all the words. Okay, if you notice, I have added two training examples, one from each class, to the data set where all the words are present. So I am allowed to do this. So typically, your data set will be quite large. Okay, and just adding one, one or two training examples is not going to matter a lot. Okay, so this is what we do now. Can someone tell me? Have assigned is arbitrary or? Ah, uh, which one? The all you included all the words in the data set. So we got that one. Added the classes zero. Ah, uh, sorry, I, I am yeah. like uh, for the one two three or one two three four five six seven eight nine zero. For that, how did to make the classes zero? No, I made. I added the same example to both class zero and class one. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. Right. So just to make so why why did I do that so that. The zero probabilities do not come up. So, for example, this word five was not there in the class zero. Now, that word five is there in the class zero. 
so some non zero probability i want to give them okay so now what do you think pj0 will is going to be uh 3 by 4 3 by 4 it is 1 uh, 1 and on 3 by 4 i think okay right so small adjustment so your your denominators of everything will go to 4 and uh, some of them will be 3 by 4 2 by 4 will become half and so on right so now you see that there is no estimate having a zero probability okay i hope you all are able to see that because of adding these two examples one to each class all zero estimates have now disappeared okay yeah so in a larger data set it is possible that we could not add all the words in a training data set no ah uh, that is correct uh, but even if so even in a large data set right so let's say a data set that has vocabulary size 10000 right now you can't expect every single one of those 10000 words to appear right so there may be some really rare words that never make an appearance in your training data set right if you if you take a standard english uh, data so let's say you are training something on uh, all the literature books uh, the written by or, so, or all the books written by jk rowling assume that you are training some model on that data now you can't expect jk rowling to have used every single word in the english dictionary right she would have obviously missed out on few very rare words okay so you have to somehow include that so it's a, it's a convenient solution to make one training example that has all the words in your vocabulary and add them to both positive and negative class okay so that's a convenient fix that's why we go for that all right so that is laplace smoothing now let's go back and see if it has fixed our problem again same example but with these new parameters right 8216 so what do you expect will happen now is our problem solved will we get some now it won't be zero okay all right so stare at the parameters closely and see if that optimism is still set is zero the way is it zero what what term is making it zero p4 of zero Okay, so P four, P four. Okay, P four of zero. If you notice, is one. But then P four of you, P four of zero. The four, word four doesn't appear in our text example, right? So training, so test data point. Therefore, is also zero. Oh. Okay, so I'll just tell you. It's very intuitively you can understand this very well. So I'll go back to the data set, right? what are we asking we are asking the probability of 8216 coming from this distribution right 8216 remember those four words now if you look at all zero examples okay look, look at what happens to four four appears in the first example it appears in the second one third one fourth one right that's why the probability of four in zero is one okay so what it means in simple terms is according to our model that we have trained the the word four should appear in every single tra- example that you generate okay you cannot if you if you toss that coin corresponding to four it will always come as, come up as heads okay so according to our model that we have created you cannot generate a training example that does not have four in it what you have done is you have your test example does not have four in it so very obviously Just to give, just to be. <coughs> you see the logic, the basic intuition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So this is what is happening. You Now let's see if the situation is any better for last one. Last. Okay. So again, P three one is one. So this is zero, right? Again, if you go back and see, what happened? Yeah, one three in class one. 
Yeah, right. So three occurs in every single example. Therefore, your model feels that three will be present in every every example generated from this model. Okay, from this distribution. So you are now stuck again. So what do you do? You have to decrease the probabilities which have one as which are having one should decrease the probability. Correct. Right. So the troublemakers are ones. Okay, one is the troublemaker. So what do you add to the data set so that this one will come down? We need to take all the data sets except the ones which are one. And call the name except the where the probabilities are not ones. Okay. We can add some training data which doesn't contain this. Yes, sir. We should add data which don't have probability as one. Okay, right. That's one idea. There is a there, it, apparently there is a simple fix. Okay, and that's for as follows. Do you see what the fix is? On the left hand side, you'll be able to see it. Uh, I think so you have added an added an empty training data point. So where the feature values are all zero. So earlier, what did we do? We added ones. So Think about this as one, right? These are all what? 10 ones. Now you're adding 10 zeros. You're adding 10 zeros and one to class zero, one to class one. Okay, now what this will do is even for so the word like phi, right? A word like phi earlier was what? Not phi, uh, which one? Three. Uh, three, right? So this is. Uh, it's four by five. Ah, uh, four by five. Yeah, correct. Right. So earlier the word four was appearing in all the examples. Now what happens? There is going to be always one example where no word is there. Right. No word is present. So it will always be less than one. So these two examples that we have added have ensured that none, nothing is going to be one. Okay. Is, is this clear? What we have done? We have added four data points. Totally. Right? So two which have all features one and two which have all features zero. Right. So this was actually a nice point suggested by uh, course instructor Nitin, right? This is his finding actually. He only found out that it's not enough if you add only uh, all ones. It's also important that you have to add zeros, right? So this is the credit to this goes to Nitin. Okay, so this is what you have done. Now let's go back. If you cal calculate p of 8, 2, 1, 6, given y equal to 0, you will end up with some probability, right? Some non zero probability. It's 0 0.0032. Okay, it's just a matter of multiplying these numbers. I leave you to do that and verify that. Now, what do you expect p of this given y equal to 1 to be? Will it be higher than this or lower than this? Intuitively, what do you expect? I think it should be higher. It, it should be higher. Okay. So greater than and equal to zero. Okay. With respect to this, what will it be? So will it be a lower value? Will, will it be lesser than 0 0.0032 or will it be like more than 0 0.003? Lesser. Lesser. Less lesser right because intuitively that's how the data set has been generated where more even is zero more odd is one okay so if you cal calculate it it turns out to be one power 10 power minus four okay so one order of in fact how many two orders of magnitude nearly less than this right so this agrees with our intuition of how the data set is generated okay now let's go to the actual prediction part. So far, we have just been calculating p of x given y. So we now need to calculate the whole thing, right? p of y given x. That is the probability, actually. So that is the base rule. We are just. Sir, I have a doubt in Laplace smoothing. Yeah. Um. So if we are adding a, a like a dictionary of all the words in it, and when we compare it to like a data set with with like a large data set with it, the probability of, you know, that word will be very small, like close, very close to zero. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, then 
will it make that kind of difference because it will be very close to zero uh right so will you, are you you're asking whether that will affect, affect the- yeah, like or or make the changes which we want in in our probabilities uh so that has one advantage and one disadvantage right as you said when you add for example if there are like 1000 uh, say 10000 words and you just add one word by smoothing you just make it one so it becomes 1 by 10000 let's say that's a very small number okay so that might give problems when you multiply it with other numbers okay uh computationally you take care of that by computing the log probability instead of just probability so this becomes even though they are small numbers in probability when you take the logarithm it's much easier to deal with them so that is the computational way to tackle the small probability issue uh, but uh, did i get your question correctly i don't know so was that your question or was it something else yeah that was my question so taking log will uh... convert the products into sum yeah so this will not this will no longer be such a small number it will be minus 4 right so adding numbers like minus it will all be negative numbers by the way so uh, adding these numbers is kind of easier than multiplying small numbers okay. thank you thank you sir yeah okay so this is the prediction right just base rule now what is the denominator going to be Just total probability, right? So, what is that total probability? Uh, can you expand that? What there will be two terms, right? What are those two terms? Uh, that is uh, in both the class. You... Okay, in both the classes, right? That's correct. So, this will be just the same numerator term, which is class one, and then x given y plus. Okay, I have made a mistake, so this should be class zero. Okay, so I'll correct them while uploading. So it should be p of y equal to zero into p of x given y equal to zero. So that change we have to make. So the prior is is the same here, point five, point five. So here it doesn't matter, but still I have added for completeness. If you compute it, it it comes out to be point zero three. P of y equal to zero. What will it be given x? This is point zero three. What will be p of y equal to one given x? Uh, y equal to zero mm-hmm. given x. Point nine seven. Point nine seven. Right. So you don't even need to compute it, but still I just computed it this way. So, so you predict this as class zero because that probability is higher than the previous probability. Right. So that's how you do prediction in naive base. Ah, uh, but such uh, such type of question in exam it takes too much, and I think. It- Ah, this is a more of a but, an example, um, right? But 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 given the preference uh, of uh, I had uh, of you people for Bayes theorem, I think such such question will come will definitely come. Uh, may come, may not come. So I cannot deterministically answer that question. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Okay, so yeah, but better to be prepared. Uh, so. Uh, but, but. But actually, this base theorem in exam there there is there is one or two silly mistake and it, it was difficult to get to the correct result. Ah, right. Yeah. So that's unfortunate, but we'll have to somehow see it, right? Okay, right. So that's name base uh, prediction. I, just a few more words. So. If you are only asked to find the label, okay. If you are not asked the actual probability, if you are asked the actual probability, you have to do all this, no escaping, right? But if you are only asked the prediction, which is which class does it belong to, you don't need to compute the denominator. Okay? You don't need to compute the denominator because it's the same for both p of y equal to x, uh, p of y equal to one given x, and p of y equal to zero given x, right? So it's enough if you compute the numerator. so whichever is greater you say that it it belongs to that particular class okay so few few terms uh, which you already know from week 4 we already seen all this but uh, it's useful to remember it this way right p of y equal to 1 is what it's the probability of this data point x 
belonging to class one or coming from class one before you see the evidence right before the data is given to you how likely do you think it belongs to class one that's the prior likelihood is what assuming that it has come from class one how likely is it okay, how likely is that this piece of example has come from class one that is why it's called the likelihood okay posterior is what given that i have seen my evidence and i have measured my likelihood how what probability is it that it will belong to class one that is the that is likelihood property the posterior one sorry can you come the likelihood like after calculating the likelihood then we do the posterior one so, ah, we yeah we multiply it by the prior uh, divide by the evidence and that gives us the posterior okay so right so if the priors are equal okay and this is only for the priors being equal these two terms are the same okay so de to determine which class the data point belongs to it's enough if you compare only the likelihood values okay i hope that is clear if the prior is the same you can just look at which class is more likely to generate this data point and use that to determine the predicted label okay but you have to be careful this is only if the priors are equal okay, so that is uh, that now dash and boundary i i really don't know if you want to see this uh, because it's there in the lectures it's slightly i on algebra right so do you want me to go over this or does anyone want me to go over this part or uh, we can, uh, i think better to skip this part okay so you can take a look at it i have written down the steps involved so but you need to understand still what that boundary is right so the boundary is the point where both of them have the same probability in some sense right so that that is the line where both of them have the same probability class one and class zero okay so if you take the lawn of this and uh, see you'll, you'll you'll see that it turns out to be a linear boundary okay so Russian boundary is linear in the features is what it means i'm leaving the algebra for you to work out later okay so that brings us to an end as far as naive base is concerned now there is one section on Ga gaussian naive base that sarah described so that is for multiple features right so what we have done sorry uh, non binary features okay so if you have features that are continuous which is more likely in real world data sets what do we do we move on to uh, a model called gaussian naive base so in the literature, you'll also see these two terms, and I'm going to use these two terms. It's called linear and quadratic discriminant analysis. Okay, it's not a very complex idea. It's actually simple. You assume that these, these are two blocks coming from two classes, right? Green class and red class. So what you do is you model them using a Gaussian distribution. Only thing is that it's not a simple one-dimensional normal distribution it's two dimensional okay so that's what discriminant analysis does for you you assume that the data for each class comes from a gaussian distribution a multivariate gaussian distribution okay now how many of you know about covariance matrices in the context of multivariate distributions Hey, or, so anyone else who knows about this uh, why coherence matter how they are used what is their role they act like a variance right? I mean, with normal distribution yeah multivariate yeah so they extend the idea of variance and variance to higher dimensional yeah exactly. case. right so depending on the kind of covariance matrix you have the data will be differently distributed okay so since we have some time i can go over 
what this means. If anyone is interested, I can spend some time on this. Yes, dear Nick. Yeah. So uh, I'll just tell you what this is about. Maybe it's in few lines of code. It won't be too hard, but interesting. This is a collab for Nave base that I was working on. Okay, so I'll show you these data sets, how they were generated. Okay, so there is this uh, special file. Write it from scratch so that kind of follow what's happening. So ignore this part. This is just a random number generator. I just want you to look at I want you to look at this part. How many of you are familiar with NumPy? Some NumPy, basic NumPy? Yes, sir. OK, you're all familiar, right? Yes, sir. Okay. So, I'll go back and keep going back to this one and the slide and the code. Okay, so I am trying to generate 1,000 data points from two classes, right? Red class and green class. Now, the mean of the red class, I call that as mu zero. Okay, mu zero is where it's minus five pi. Okay, minus five pi is where I, I, I have the mean of the red class. Now, the mean of the green class is pi comma pi. So that is mu one. Mu one is five comma five. Now, what I call the covariance matrix is the idea of how two features vary with each other. Okay, so there is feature x and feature x one and feature x two. If the features x one and x two do not have any variance or covariance, then this these two terms are zero, right? So what are these two terms? It's actually this matrix, right? So remember covariance matrix from PCA. What is that? So this will be one by one by n. variance of the variance, right? So it will be the variance of the first feature. And this will be the covariance of first and second feature. Second and first feature. Yeah, right. So this will be the covariance of the the two features, right? So x1, x2, x2, x1 is symmetric. So we can writing it the same as that, right? So the example that I have taken is there is no covariance. So these two off diagonal terms are zero. Okay. Now with this particular setup, I am generating the data. So x0 is all the red data points, x1 is all the green data points, and then I'm putting it into this data set x. Okay, and then I'm plotting it. So this is what is called a scatter plot, right? So x comma y alone, all the x values, x1 values, and all the x2 values on the y-axis, and I give them some color. Okay, that is something I've already generated. So if you plot this, you will get uh, this particular image. Let's wait for it to run. That's a small word, like that. Something will go before for it as a variable, like, like what does that? specifically do is, is something this one yeah oh, okay okay sorry i added it for some some other purpose which i'll explain now but actually it should be only covariance oh, okay so, yeah okay so this is what uh, you get okay so this is just to make the graph look slightly cleaner not so dense okay and these are just few things okay so this is for what, what we have done is we have used the same covariance matrix for generating both the data sets, or rather both the classes, right? So that's what we have done here. Now, I'll show you what happens when we increase this correlation term. Currently, this is 1. This is also 1. This is 0. This is 0, right? Now, let's I'll show you what happens when I change this to 0.8 and 0.8. 
Okay, I'm going to change this to point eight. Point eight. See what you. Okay, do you see why we are getting this kind of a graph or this kind of a distribution of points? As we have a correlation between the x one and x two, it's kind of elliptical. It's not. Correct, right. So this is a positive correlation between features one and two. Therefore, as x one increases, x two is also going to increase, and there is a strong positive correlation. So let's see what happens if we make this zero point nine nine, zero point nine nine. So let's try that out. Let's just make this nine nine and what will happen to these uh, these two blocks? Even more stronger. Even more strong, right? So very strong correlation, and it almost looks like a line. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so it almost looks like a line. Now let's do the opposite. Now let's say this is zero point minus zero point eight and minus zero point eight. Now what hap? What do you think is going to happen to the left to right? Left to right, right? So that's correct. So they are they are no negatively correlated. So as x one increases. X two is going to decrease. Yeah. Okay, so a negative correlation. So now what we we'll now do is, of course, you can make it even more negative, and it look like a line, right? So all this we have done. So this is what you see as same covariance matrix, right? So that's why I've written down here identical covariance matrices. Okay. Now if you have different covariance matrices. Uh, What I'm positive, right? Ah, sorry, I. Uh... And so we can make one as positive and other negative to get the image. Ah, right. So, ah, uh, no. What what I'll do is I'll I'm going to give different covariance matrices for x zero and x one itself, right? So I'm going to say ah, uh, right. You are saying one as positive, one as negative, right? That's what I'm doing. The same x one. Yeah. So I'm going to make one. I'm going to add this matrix in the one in one case. I'm going to subtract this matrix in the other case, right? So what I've done is off-diagonal entries are point eight, right? So for one, I'm adding the off-diagonal entries. For the other, I'm subtracting them. This is what happens. Okay, so this is positively correlated. That is negatively correlated. So that is the graph that you see here. So different covariance matrices used to generate the two classes. Basically, one is pointed, the other one is minus pointed. Yeah, and the off-diagonal elements are the only difference in these two. Oh. Okay. Now, if you fit a model, so these are called LDA and QDA. The the short term is linear discriminant analysis. LDA. This other one is QDA. So, if you fit a model assuming identical covariance matrices for this data set, you get something like this, right? The decision boundary is linear. Okay, you get a line separating these two. Blobs. On the other hand, if you assume different covariance matrices and proceed with the analysis, okay, what you will end up is something that is quadratic in nature, right? The decision boundary. Okay, so roughly this is what is covered in the lectures, but the name given is Gaussian uh, naive base. You you can refer the literature and you, you will see that another other names are also available. So LDA and QDA are Two such names, LDA. You have to remember is linear, therefore the boundary is linear. QDA is quadratic, therefore the boundary is quadratic. And when when does it become linear? Quadratic depends on the assumption that you make about the covariance matrix. Okay, so that might have been a bit heavy, but uh, that's the final point in week six that you have to remember. I have a small doubt. Does the uh, this decision boundary depends on the support contour maps, basically something like that? So the boundary depends on the covariance Con matrix, right? And and uh, the contour, contour maps of the graphs or something like that. Ah, uh, the contours also depend on the covariance. So it's like the covariance yeah, matrix yeah. influences both of them. Oh, okay. right. So in this case, yeah. the co the contours are going to be circular. 
Right, so this is kind of pushing the screw, right? This yeah, is yeah. kind of pushing through the whole thing. Right, in fact, yeah, that's a. In fact, we can try slightly different things for both. Uh, that will be interesting, and because I have the, I have the whole code here. We can try out what happens if we do this quadratic thing, but for slightly different covariance matrices, right? So, you can do all sorts of funny things, right? Once you have the code with you. Let me go back and say for one it is zero point eight and a zero point six four, right? I add this to this and I create a separate one for the other one. Okay, so this is let's say it won't be symmetric, one issue. Okay, so let me I'm changing the data set orientation size and all that, right? So this is what I have. Now you notice that slightly it has come down, right? It's not jutting out so much like you had earlier, right? You can uh, in fact play around with different configurations and see what happens. As well as we have decreased the correlation between one and two, right? right. It's point four, so that's why it's actually getting down. right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. In fact, yeah, we can also try that. So if you if you make them identical, so if you make them both have the same covariance matrix, and even if you run this thing called QDA, you you will end up with uh, you have to end up with the same as a linear boundary, right? I may have subtracted this. Yeah, subtracted. Right? So if you if you run it with this same covariance matrix, it's almost nearly, same. yeah, almost yeah. Same, right. So anyway, so that's the thing that Char discusses towards the end of the lectures of week eight. So again, I'm not going into the mathematical details. As it all depends on this covariance matrix. So I just given you some intuition on what the covariance matrix is. How if you change it, you will get different kinds of uh, data sets and how that influences the decision boundary okay so yeah so that's all i had for today's session okay <clears throat> so naive q why when do we learn this type of coding uh okay can you Repeat that. Uh, I mean, rephrase that question in some other. When do we learn? We're asking when do we apply naive base? Is it? That's actually a very intuitive doubt. Uh, like we have so many algorithms, like decision tree, and like you know, we have done K and decision tree, and this naive base. So, what kind of uh, like? When to apply when? Like we have all classification problems now. Maybe we'll be learning about perceptron to SVM logistic regression. So how to identify like which classification algorithm to choose when? It's like is it going to be a no random choice? Like I just go with all the algorithms which gets the best accuracy or something? Or data intuitively can we find it somewhere? Okay, so I am I don't have a very good answer for this, or even a reasonable answer. But certain algorithms, for example, naive base, right? It has apparently yeah. it works well for text, is what they say. Okay. Okay. So naive base works well for text. Now, if you look at any kind of tabular data, tabular data is all that we are dealing with in our course, right? Decrossing yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. Right? So if you look at tabular data with predominantly continuous features. No, SVMs are very good at it. So SVM is the po most powerful classifier uh, that we'll study in the course, right? In some sense. Yeah. Now, SVMs yeah. are very good there. Now, if you have data which has a mix of categorical features along with continuous features, then things like SVM may not perform that well. So you, you categorical in the sense it's like order or something. 
uh, yeah, order or say uh, gender order, okay. sorry, uh, gender and in anything, say income level. So high, okay. low, medium, right? Okay, yeah. Uh, so categories, right? Or, or yeah. your the classification on the whole sense, like it's like a category, like multi class problems. Like is it, I mean, uh, that label. is the label, right? So the label, yeah, yeah but even features. So if you're if your income level is a feature, and okay. income level okay, okay. a feature five, category. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So the okay. nature of variable, right, which we studied in stats one or yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So when the features themselves become categorical and are not the continuous, then you can't easily differentiate or you, you can't even represent them properly, right? So yeah, there are things like decision trees, the uh, and random forests. All those things will come in. Uh, but I. The state of the art, right? If you ask me what the state of the art is currently, what is the most popular? It's neural networks. Yeah, new deep learning. Right? Yeah, so. for, yeah, for the, like, most of the things because it captures, like I have gone through some like uh, things like auto encoders, which actually get, you know, to say very important features and then try to implement in a neural network for a very good accuracy or something. But I'm going, I'm like wanted to stick with this course. I mean, and try to get which algorithm, like, like uh, gets out better. Like, yeah, I've heard SVM does good on the whole. Like on an average, people say SVM and logistic regression have a very good hand. So I just had this confusion. Like, mm, right. Is it having any data intuitive things that need to find out which algorithm better suits for? Them? Sure, sure. Yeah. So SVMs and uh, logistic regression, random for us are very good when it comes to tabular data. But when you go to unstructured data, right? Uh, by unstructured data, I mean images. Or videos, yeah. then right? deep learning for neural networks. Yeah. That's what I believe in some workshop. Right, yeah, that's correct. So neural networks rule the rules. So they are most popular. And I have some doubts in one of the quiz two papers. So can like we anyway, discuss like it it has a like even this I mean linear quality or not linear like night base or have some small doubts can I share my screen and like have yeah that. not even this like I have really like for linear regression too can I just yeah yeah sure just can you see my screen is it visible yes yes yeah, like one question was uh, this question uh, looks so basic, but is it? Uh, I mean, is it a direct fact or like you know, is there some intuition between this norm y square? This one we have here. We have data matrix, linear regression model. <laughs> See, this is kind of you can ignore this question because first uh, yeah. W star is in the span of the data point. Okay. Yeah. So it can't at the same time be perpendicular to the data point, right? So yeah. it can only happen if W star is zero. Yeah, that's true. right. So ignore this question. This question there was a small problem with this. So okay. And this one again, like okay, I, 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 you can read the question. Like the first option, yes, I can agree. But why not the second option? Why? I mean, uh, why can't it achieve a zero training error in this? If suppose it's linear, I mean, or something like that. No, you can achieve zero training error if h of x i is. Uh, okay, sorry. What is it? So your h of the following will certainly achieve zero training error. On a data set and the error is okay, a few may say okay. Uh, if you could find the W, then I believe it should achieve it. It need not be equal to, so the actual relationship need not be linear, right? If it is linear, you will be able to find a W, but if it is not linear, then you okay, will. It's not like YI is not W transpose. It's just yeah, so what yeah. if for so if YI is in the span of uh, you, if you remember, yeah, I thought like, yeah, yeah, I got it. Like, I thought like, why is this W transpose say or something? It's why is a line. That's it. I thought. Ah, uh, right. This in the case, then yes, this should be done. And this one more, like, I have this very like uh, doubt, like from MLF to MLF, MLT, like MLF. We had this equation, like 
X transpose X, the inverse X transpose Y for getting the W star or something. Correct, correct. Yeah. And in MLT now we are having this included like X, X transpose the whole inverse. And now here in this question, we usually have column matrix as X and uh, row matrix as Y. So, I mean, I mean, these are not row matrix as like X transpose. So, what, I mean, if I do this formula, the first formula, it's going to have 0.5. I mean, the answer is perfect. But the second one, if I try, it's going to take me, a, I mean, it's going to take a lot of time because I have to calculate the inverse of XX transpose and then XY and then try to, I mean, I can't even divide, I believe. Like, it's going to, I go, I'm going to get a matrix or something like that. So, what can I do in such questions? What, I mean, okay, patience so I have to follow. You have to, for our course, it's XX transpose inverse XY. Yeah. Okay, so in this case, uh, what X should have been given as? It's a D but this is right, actually. If, if X is given as this, then XX transpose XY is actually going to give me some, uh, it's going to give me a value, literally. But in notations in lectures, we al always have X as like this, right? Always like transpose, like we'll have a column matrix, usually. So, uh, yeah, but see, this is D cross N, right? In fact, this is... This is yeah. not a transpose, right? It's one cross three. Yeah. So n cross d, right? I mean, uh, one in, data. In point. our in, in our yeah. course, it's d cross n. X yeah. is always d cross n, right? So this yeah. is one feature and three data points. Yeah. Right. So see here in this particular case, there is only one feature. You should not be going for the matrix form because okay. you can solve it using first principle. So y equals yeah. to w x, right? So w yeah, y yeah, minus yeah. So you can use that. In general, yeah, you have to assume it's d cross n and proceed. Because like I have like lambda equals 50, so x, x, x transpose plus lambda times of i will be there, right? In the rich regression part. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So okay, that's that. And, uh, this one. Okay. Yeah, this one again. Like I have a small doubt with, okay, I can understand this, why this actually I have drawn the diagram with something like, uh, I believe uh, these two points are here and uh, the other point, this is like one and this is minus one and uh, this W is going to like uh, divide it. But what does like each W is like Y equals to, is it like something like W naught plus W one X and uh, are these like the part of, like one and two are like w naught and w one is it something like that like i don't get exactly idea what is this w means i mean is so it like for a linear classifier w transpose x sign of w transpose x is what matters right y is equal yeah. to the predicted value of y is sign of w transpose x so you have to okay look at that's it it's just w transpose x like uh, we don't have any bias here that's it right i mean uh, so. yeah it's just w1 x1 plus w2 x2 sign of that so you have to look at okay. which side of the hyperplane the point falls. okay so nothing much we have to decide on yeah 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 okay and uh, the last question was actually about and uh, this one actually we have like y i equal to b naught it's a linear regression model they have stated so we need not to apply any formula just we have to average it out or something is it like that correct if you have the answer. yeah if yeah. you have a constant you are fitting a constant right here yeah so yeah you're fitting a that's constant it. it will be the average of the labels yeah. that's it that that's, all, that's all that's all yeah true. you don't need to yeah and this one that i have got i think yeah and this one like uh, the other this is the like now we have discussed naive way so what I did was P03, basically this was, I have like, I had X and Y. So P03 is like, you know, I have taken like the two features of zero, which is two and the third feature to be one, which actually only this classifies. So it's 0.5, it's, it's fine. Mm -hmm. But for this one, like one, zero, zero, we have to like get it means like, we have to, how to actually, like, uh, is it something like, I what I got was like, both were almost zero because I got like, P zero one or something was again. Uh, we had zero one. Just a minute. Right. We had zero one. We had zero one is going to be like is it out of two, almost two zeros? I have just one, right? I mean two zeros. I don't have any one literally. Right? It will be uh, P hat one will be zero. Yeah, so we had so this whole thing will be zero then zero label will be whole zero. Right. And similarly, like P had one, two. 
okay this one oh, oh we had one two was literally out of two i have like maybe i don't have anything right zero yeah yeah so okay P, oh, so then it's one minus p hat one two so it's just one because it's one means it's just p hat one one which is just i believe okay i got it uh, one minute okay so it's okay i got it i got made it out here it's okay i was i thought like p hat one two was the one but it's one minus p hat one two so it's just one but uh, if suppose uh, if suppose two thing is done then we have to add and label like one 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 and one 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 zero right uh, something like right? uh, suppose yeah, also zero 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 yeah zero 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 and one and zero 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 we have to add these four labels right? yeah we have to so add these four yeah oh, yeah thanks yeah right anything else anyone if not we can someone had question in week six is that person still around or Anyway, so that's all uh, for today. We will try to meet some more time. Thank you, sir. Take yeah. care. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Sir, now the presentation.